Hi guys, welcome back to the Confused Millennial Podcast. I'm Rachel, your host and the blogger behind theconfusedmillennial.com. And this is episode 14. We are going to be talking with Shaman Dirk towards the end. But first, I am joined by my sometimes, most of the time, co-host, Eric. Hey, world. (laughs) So if you're new to this podcast, um, it is all about helping you embrace more of who you are while navigating this whole adulting thing. We have guests on sometimes, like today's a very special one. And other times we break down some of the blog posts into just more detail since they can be pretty heavy, big topics sometimes. Yeah, they can. So today though, we are honored. We are actually doing a two episode series with today's guest, Shaman Dirk, our beloved friend, teacher. What would you, how would you describe (laughs) house guest? (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I guess how Shaman Dirk came into our life. We're gonna start off this episode by talking a little bit about him. The second half, I'm going to bring him in. He's going to share what shamanism is, and he's going to share a little bit of his life story to becoming a shaman. Next week's episode, he's going to give us tons of actionable, valuable advice for you know building our own spiritual practices, the shamanic perspective of mental health, how to raise your intuition, all sorts of goodies. So that's going to be next week's episode. So today... I guess we wanted to give some backstory because if you've been a reader of the blog, you know, like I started off this year shaman with shaman fever, I guess you could call it. Yeah, I think that's what I would call it. (laughs) So uh, at the end of last year, December 2017, I entered my Saturn return. This kind of like big spiritual jump started again for me. And I was cooking in my kitchen when a podcast episode auto played from like August Uh, where this woman who was a shaman was on it and talking about her spiritual gifts and her psychic abilities. And I was like, oh my God, this sounds so much like different points of my life. What is this shaman school business? I'm going to apply and find out. Fast forward two days later is when I come across Shaman Derek. And I listened to his story, which he's going to tell you later on in this episode. And I was just like, it was a very deep knowing of like, this all makes so much sense. Like I, I know this person, I know everything he's talking about. This is, I need to know more. I need to meet him. Yeah. It was, it was very matter of fact. And so matter of fact that when she told me we were going to see him, uh, I was just like, okay, sure. You, you, you seem like this is something we need and should do. So I was totally on board. Yeah. So December, I applied to Shaman School. I reached out to Shaman Dirk's team. So Shaman School is not related to Shaman Dirk. We'll get there. I reached out to Shaman Dirk's people and I didn't hear from them for three weeks. And I was like, I guess I'm not going to work with him. And I'm going down this whole other uh, Shaman School path. And so while I was researching about shamans, what I kind of like learned and what really resonated with me was they were kind of in the old days when we lived in tribes and stuff like that in communities of like a hundred people. The shaman was the person that lived on the outskirts of town. Um, They were really the bridge between the physical community and the spiritual world. They were the healers. They were the medicine men, medicine women. Kind of, I want to say like everything I was reading, they kind of sounded like they were misunderstood. They kept to themselves. Um, But highly regarded at the same time. Highly, highly regarded, highly, highly respected. They were just kind of these knowing beings. And like that resonated with so much of how I've lived my life, feeling like I was on the outskirts of of just society, town, communities. Like I was just watching it all happen. I would be the person that so many people would come to. So it's like, maybe I'm a shaman. <laughs> um, I, She's not exaggerating. That was legitimately the conversation that she had towards me. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I was like, I'm going to go to the shaman school and whatnot. So like January 2nd hits, I think, circa around that time. And I get an email from Shaman Dirk's people and they're like, hey, he'll be in Miami, which is only an hour from us on these dates. You guys can book a one-on-one on this time. And he's going to be hosting a Shaman boot camp. We're just figuring out the details. So I immediately was like, okay, Eric, you're taking off work. We're driving down to Miami and like we're having one-on-one sessions. Those were life-changing. Yeah, they were really impactful. Yes. Do you want to share anything about yours? Because you went in first. 
Yeah, so I didn't know what to expect. Like I said, you know, Rachel said we should do this. Like we, we are doing this. I said, okay. And I, I didn't put much thought into what I was going to be getting from it or what it was going to be like during. So I walked in there and I'm greeted by this gentleman and he gives me this just massive hug and it's like warm and inviting and just you can feel energy like radiating through your body during this thing. And there is the brief moment where you're like, okay, this is going on a long time. And then you snap back in and you realize this is just all love and you, you just give into it. And so uh, I was immediately put at ease. And then we sit down on this sort of mattress he had on the floor in this apartment and he jumps right into it, man. And he starts reading my uh, medical alchemy chart. I said that correctly, right? No, it's no. your energy alchemy. Your energy alchemy. <laughs> chart. And he's like, I see a circle and a triangle over here. And I see an owl on top of a rabbit over here. And here's what this means. And here's what that means. And flip over your arm and let me read your veins. And it was just like, I was like, what is that? He moves really fast. Yeah. I would definitely, if you ever work with him, recommend recording your session. Yeah. Record your session. And also you may not get to them, but it's always helpful to have questions prepared. Yeah. And not everyone's experience is going to be the same. Like I, he read Eric's energy alchemy and he read my energy alchemy. Me. Um, he didn't read my veins this first time. He does read my veins actually for the first time ever in next week's episode. So you guys can get a little bit of a taste of a little bit of what he does, but essentially he's able to pull like all of, he calls it reading your files. It is essentially able to pull all of the history and like who your soul is at its core level and like pulls information from your spirit guides. It's essentially like all I don't even know because it's just like so expansive that I feel like words don't even do it justice but imagine walking to a room and sitting down and having somebody look at you and like look at the air around your head and be like oh you're a very old soul you have the tree of wisdom you're actually here to be a know-it-all and people here are literally this is from what he told me he's like you're supposed to give advice to people they're supposed to pay you uh, for giving advice and like you're just supposed to tell people how to fix stuff like like you have this kind of like eagle eye view if you will yeah. And so with me, you know, he's like, oh, I'm seeing that you're having pain in the lower left side of your back. Is that true? Yes. OK, well, here's why that's happening. And then uh, he, he went in to say, you know, well, I'm getting messages from spirit that you're not addressing a conversation that you're supposed to be having with some people. And that's what's, you know, playing into a lot of this lower back pain. And I was like, OK. And that led me to the one important question that I have going into my session, which was, should I join my now business partner on this new venture? Um, it was moving really fast. And he talked to my spirit council and spirit council said yes. And then he asked them why, and they gave him the reasons why, and it all checked out to me. <laughs> and so that was, that was a, you know, what I needed to hear. Uh, either way, it was fine. I needed an answer. And and the fact that he gave validation to why it was a yes also helped. And then he started teaching me how to talk to my spirits. And I hit a little bit of a wall there. I got a little frustrated. And so that's when we moved into the shamanic trance portion. So let's pause there real quick about you tr trying to talk to spirits and getting frustrated. So in next week's episode, he actually... Get it takes you guys through two exercises that you can do to talk to spirits. One of them is a writing exercise, which I get frustrated because I, he, I learned initially with him how to talk to spirits directly, like in your head. So when I was doing the writing exercise, it got in my way because I was allowing myself to overthink things because I, as you'll hear in next week's episode too, he tells me, um, I think too much. So um, there are a few different ways to kind of like go about uh, breaking down that barrier to talk to spirits. And you ended up learning like a big sh uh, eye opener in boot camp about talking to spirits. Yes, boot camp changed a lot for me. Yeah. Do you want to tell everyone what the eye opener was? Well, yeah. But before we get there, I think it's really important to understand how we ended up at boot camp. 
Well, yeah. Okay, fine. And we're just on this topic. I'm going to just tell you guys because it's on this topic right now. And then we'll get into how we ended up at bootcamp. Okay, so I'll share. <laughs> you know, steal my thunder. Okay, <laughs> fine. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I was stuck on this fact, you know, that people legitimately were like seeing spirits, you know, like um, some Sixth Sense stuff. Um, so I, 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 or images or anything. What I learned in boot camp that changed my understanding of everything was the concept of when we actually are putting thought to something, we're pushing that thought. So you feel it in the front of your brain. When it's spirit, those those immediate messages you get in the back of your head, you don't know where they came from. It's just that it, it t- gives you the answer. That's spirit. Yeah. Um, so like when you, and that's why he always like teaches us to talk to spirit out loud. So like asking a question, like, why am I feeling blocked about advancing in my career? And then, uh, hearing that voice in like the tiny voice in the back of your head. Um, and the reason he recommends doing it out loud is so that way it's easier to differentiate between that voice where you're pushing and the frontal, that louder voice from that quieter voice. Um, and eventually you can kind of do it all in your head. But I know as somebody that has tried doing it all in my head because I've been out in public and don't want to look like I'm talking to myself, it can kind of become a little bit more confusing. Yeah, there's been points where I've had more success than others with that. Yeah. So, and then Eric went into his healing. He leaves his healing. I walk into the room after he's done with his healing and he looks like his hair's all over the place. He looks like he's drenched in sweat. And he's like, I've never done ecstasy before, but I'm pretty sure this is what it feels like. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, I was sweating and vibrating and my legs were all wobbly and I was sort of in this euphoric state. Yeah. And then I go in for my session. So it starts off very similar. He reads my energy alchemy. We end up extracting a dark spirit that had been trapped in my energy field and had been talking to me and giving me a lot of self-defeating thoughts. And so in this episode, uh, Shaman Dirk talks about the darkness. And I don't remember if he touches on this or not. So I'm going to bring it up. But essentially, any sort of like negative self-talk we have usually is a dark spirit that's trapped in our energy field that's trying to shift into the light. And that'll make more sense as he talks about this being a dense realm and things like that. Um, And so we ended up extracting a spirit and and he tells me like, what did he asked me to tell him? What did I see after we're doing all this stuff? Cause I like had a vision. And so I only tell him a, a portion of what I saw. He goes, really? that's all you saw? Because this is what I saw. And he gives me everything I had seen as well as some things that I hadn't seen, but had talked about in the past with Eric. And I was like, okay, this is like real. This is definitely happening. There's no way. I literally just met this man like 10 minutes ago. There's no way he could know these things um, to that specific of a detail. So then he lays me down uh, or I lay down and he's like, okay, it's going to sound like I'm talking to you. I'm actually talking to your spirit. And he does the shamanic healing on me. Oh, before all that though, he goes to me, um, there's somebody draining you in your work life. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I have my own business. I don't like really deal with any person regularly on a day to day. He's like, no, you deal with this person every day. It says here it's in your work life. And I was like, well, I work from home. So like, I really don't deal with anyone every day. He's like, oh, you work from home. There's no separation between work and home. It's your husband. Don't worry. Way to throw me under the bus. Well, this is how we got to boot camp. And he's like, don't worry. I fixed that today. And um, the reason Eric had been draining me is what he just talked about. He was being very indecisive about this decision that he had asked Shaman about. Should he do it? Should he not do it? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, dude, just do it already. Like I'm tired of hearing this story every single day. So I was like, okay, great. Eric's going to be fixed. We do the shamanic healing. I feel amazing. The next day I feel like more clear and light and happy than I've ever felt in my life. I like have so many creative bursts. I'm literally like spinning and I have to, um, like spinning on like a workout bike, Mm. (laughs) not like spinning out. Um, I literally have to like pick up voice memo on my phone to like, just get ideas out because the creativity and there was just so much flowing through me so clearly. And like, I felt like my entire life had been mapped out and just lit up for me. Eric, on the other hand, was an absolute nightmare. To that was a wreck. Yeah, that was an absolute wreck. <laughs> he was still being indecisive despite getting all the answers he wanted to hear. He or like needed to hear in order to make a decision. He was just... It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't indecisive. I, but I hadn't on the surface level, 
I, I decided to take action. The confidence behind that decision was still not there. And I was op- operating from a place of pure fear. Yeah. And that was like, not, I'm not into that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Those who know you know that. I'm just like, you have, you know what to do. Go ahead and get the fear out of the way and go do it. So at the end, I had skipped something. So when Eric was walking out of the room after his session, transitioning over to mine, Shaman says to him, I'll see you at boot camp. Like very matter of factly. And Eric's like in his ecstasy haze. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so at the end of my session, I go, am I supposed to go to boot camp? And Shaman is literally texting and like stops texting and shrugs and goes, if you want to bring more of your power into your body and then keeps texting. I was like, well, that wasn't very committed. And I'm supposed to go to shaman school with these other shamans the following week after boot camp, And that's just like way too much shaman stuff. So I was set on not going to boot camp after this. I felt great. I got everything I wanted to get out of it. Eric is completely miserable as we just talked about. So like two days later, I'm like, okay, no, we are going to boot camp. <laughs> like This is happening. And I'm so happy we did because... It was honestly life changing. Um, you know, we talked when we learned about some of the things that Shaman's going to talk about in this episode about just Earth and like why we're all here on Earth. Um, and then we just learned a lot of like skills and tools as far as like reading people's energy, talking to spirit council, um, working with the spirit of fire to help cleanse the physical body. Yeah. And I think what's really amazing about Shaman and his approach is that. And he'll tell you straight up, it's it's not just woo-woo spirit. There's a lot of science behind it yeah. too. So it's a, it was quite intellectual as well. We talked about linear and versus quantum thinking and what quantum is and his work with quantum mechanics and, you know, scientists. And it was, so it was just very fascinating stuff yeah. too, not just all like, setting people's stomachs on fire and, um, you know, harnessing the, our power and sending electricity through our body. While that was fun and interactive, the first day was actually very educational. Yeah. And he's very like, as you'll, uh, if you watch his Insta lives and everything, see like very engaging seeker. Oh, he's so dynamic. So yeah, that was January. Um, then the following weekend I went to shaman school. It was extremely different than shaman boot camp with shaman Dirk. And um, that's when I announced to you guys on the blog that I'm not going back to shaman school because it just felt very disempowering compared to a lot of the stuff I had been learning with shaman Dirk. And so we stayed friends uh, through all of this and we were talking and he uh, decided to come stay with us for 10 days. And As you guys will hear, I'm not really myself if you listen to this podcast regularly in these episodes. I am like sassy and testy and like kind of disengaged. And, you know, when you have so much lightness around you, it can really draw darkness because the darkness at the end of the day wants to transmute into the light. And so actually the two weeks before Shaman Dirk got here... I started having a lot of suicidal thoughts, which I hadn't had since high school. And it was an interesting experience. And we, I end up like when he was staying with us, it was like, how do I explain it? It was just a lot of the dark spirits that had been trapped in my energy field came to the head and like, we're trying to sabotage my relationship with him and push him away. And he is such a beautiful, loving person that he sat there and worked with me and pulling so many things out. Um, Yeah. Things got real. Yeah. Um, so it was, I mean, I can't, I mean, honestly, I say before, like he truly, it feels like he saved my life in so many ways. Um, oh, but he saved ours. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, and if you've been a reader of the blog a long time, if you listen to last week's episode about the advice to our younger selves, you know, I re- I've been referencing the darkness for so many years. Like it is something I've always known had existed, but it wasn't really until I met Shaman Dirk that I had it explained to me where it's like, yes, this makes sense. This is something I've always known on like a soul level. And nobody's ever taught me how to work with it, you know? And and that's the biggest thing. Like I know kind of hearing about darkness can be scary for a lot of people, but the thing I really want people to hear is like, I think on some level, we all know it exists. We watch the news, we see these tragedies, we see all this stuff happening. 
And it wasn't until I started working with Shaman Durek that I actually learned, started learning in this year, really, how to transmute so much of that stuff into the light and how to um, get rid of the heaviness and how to actually move truly, truly through it where you're not just managing and you still have it with you, but like actually learning how to get rid of it. And, And so that's why like he is such a dear friend in our lives and just an amazing teacher for so many reasons. And I absolutely love him. Yeah, we both do. He's, uh, he's brought nothing but amazing, positive, incredible life lessons, opportunities for us. And I don't mean directly like, you know, but just, just being in his presence and, and, building your own power, it just unlocks so many opportunities in your life in all areas. Yeah. You know, it, it's just such a, it was such an honor to to have him stay with us. It's mm-hmm. such an honor to be able to learn from him and mm-hmm. speak to him and watch him interact with others. And um, yeah, you know, you know, number one fan. Yeah. Um, so with that, without further ado, I'm excited to bring him in. Again, this episode is going to be kind of just more of that foundational sh- shamanism stuff. What is a shaman? His story. And then next week is just going to be jam-packed with breaking down um, mental health issues from the shamanic perspective, giving you guys actual tools and practices that you can start doing to build your intuition, um, to work with spirits, to build your psychic abilities, and so much more. So I'm really excited about these next two episodes. Um, So with that, let's bring Shaman in. Hi guys, I'm here with Shaman Derek. Welcome. Hello, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much for being here. Even though I feel like I kind of forced you into it because you're in my house right now. So you don't really have an option for being here. I would be doing your podcast anyway because you're an amazing person and you're bringing really, really solid information to people out in the world. So I think it's very important. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So let's start off with the basics because my audience is not the super woo-woo out there type. So what is a shaman for all of them? Well, shamanism isn't about woo-woo out there, but I understand what you mean by that because of basis consensus of society and not really understanding that, um, the meaning of a shaman. A shaman is what we would say a mediator, uh, one who's here to bridge the gap between the spirit world and the physical world in a way that's accessible and full of not, uh, and, and, and without the nonsense basically, without the woo-woo, as you just said, Mm -hmm. and really piece together the broken pieces that people create in their lives by not being authentic to themselves and honoring themselves at the highest level. And by being really, um, you know, conformed by society's viewpoints from parentals or guardians that have had very old, outdated paradigm thoughts about the world and how the world operates and how psychology and all of these things operate and really giving you a different point of structure to be able to navigate your life in a more easier and effective way. And by doing that, we put the power back in your hands so that you have the tools both for your emotional intelligence and for your mental acuity to be able to assess situations from a different point of view where you're not getting so caught up in the maya or the discord of situations, but you're actually being able to look at it with common sense and then be able to deal with it and without causing, you know, disruption or pain or hurt or suffering on any level to your being. We're also here to, um, we're also here to self-preserve life, to preserve nature, to preserve people and to preserve animals in general life as a whole, and to really give people the understanding of what it means to adapt on a planet as a species and being able to work together, utilizing our greatest assets so that we can continue to thrive and move forward. Well then. Okay. So there's a lot of things you said in there that I want to come back to, especially the psychology part of this. Um, Before we get into that though, how did you become a shaman? I became a shaman. I was about five years old. I started demonstrating certain abilities as a child and my family, my grandmother and her father and his brother and so forth were a long lineage of line. I'm a third generation shaman. My family comes from uh, West Africa, from Ghana. And I began to have these abilities when I was a little kid. And then I didn't start training or taking on the intense part of the training, which was about 11 years old, which my family then felt was okay for me to begin to taking on that kind of knowledge and information. And also because my powers were growing expeditiously that 
then I began to step into, uh, you know, a very, I would guess say like a very strong place of, of looking at the world from a very young age um, and seeing the nonsense and kind of really the, the, the lies that people were living. And then really stepping into my training was the best time for me at age 11 because it gave me a different perspective. So that way I was, wasn't walking around in constant disbelief of like what I was experiencing. Because for me as a kid, I was always aware of the spirit world, aware of what people emotionally were thinking, um, what they were feeling and what they were thinking, as well as being able to understand the energies in which we're moving them and what was actually, you know, you know, like when we say like, you know, is your thoughts, your thoughts, or is your thoughts, your parents' thoughts, or is it your great grandmother's thoughts, or is it your great, great, great grandfather who made a decision about something that was passed down through bloodline and it's affecting you now. And this is the things that I was seeing as a kid. And so that's when my journey first began. And then tell everyone about when you died at 28. I was 28 years old. I had just got back from living in the jungle in Belize, in uh, Jaguar jungle. And I just got back. I was in Los Angeles uh, for, for a short time. I was actually doing something with Ellen. Uh, we were doing a, 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 per, a project that she was putting together for a commercial for American Express. And they asked me to do Tai Chi, uh, which, you know, is one of my favorite exercises. So, um, but I knew that I was going to die and I knew I was going to die in spring. And so it was all very relative to, I didn't know exactly what day it was, but I knew it was going to happen in spring. And I woke up one morning and there was this energy in my room and it said, are you ready? And I said, yes. And I fell to the floor. My kidneys had blown out from high blood pressure and I was crawling on the floor, uh, grabbed a um, telephone and called my friend Marcus. And he rushed over in his truck, grabbed me off the floor and put me in the truck and took me to, um, to the, to, was driving me to the hospital. But in the way there, I had like a seizure and smashed into his dashboard. And then, so he kept, I kept having seizures and he couldn't, couldn't control them while driving at the same time. So he ended up pulling the car over and contacting the ambulance and they came and got me. And I was already passed out from the seizures, woke up in the ambulance. They told me I had like seven or eight rolling seizures. Do you want the long version or the quick version? Go long. Okay. Because I think this is such a cool story and my audience doesn't really know who you are at all. Okay. So I uh, got to Hollywood Presbyterian. I remember being rolled on a stretcher, could hear the wheels and I could hear the sound of the hospital, you know, what you hear in, in hospitals, you know, the sounds that you hear, beeping sounds and people walking back and forth and kind of busyness going on. And uh, my friend Marcus came in because uh, he was trailing behind, I suppose. Um, that's why he came in after the ambulance, after they put me into the main area. They didn't have any rooms available, so they left me on a stretcher right where the front desk was area. I began to uh, have visions. Uh, the first vision I saw was the room turning to liquid and then to bright light. And then I could see my ancestors, like my grandmother and grandfather and like aunt and stuff like that. And then... Um, then it disappeared, and then the and then after that came the other visions, which was of a woman came to me and said to me that I was going to die, and that that she didn't want me to fight because it was going to be very painful for me. I didn't really quite understand what she meant. I was just more captivated by the fact that there was some woman speaking to me, and everything was bright light. And then I came back and my friend was asked me where I was. And I had said that, you know, there was a woman here and he was like, there's no one here. And I said, no, there was someone here talking to me. And they told me I was going to die. And he's like, no, you're not going to die. And then he said, when, when did they say you're going to die? And I said, you know, they said they're going to die within a couple minutes. And then he's like, no, I'm going to get some help. We're going to get you help right away. He's like, you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. You're going to make it through this. And within like, I, within like a second, I remember just grabbing his hands, looking at my friend Marcus and looked him in the face and said to him, I didn't want to die alone. I knew that whatever the woman said was truthful. I don't know how I knew. I just knew. And I just didn't want to die alone. And, um, he just said, he grabbed my hand really tight and, you know, I could feel his grip in my hand and he, um, told me that he wasn't going to leave me. And I remember crying. I had tears in my eyes. I wasn't like, crying profusely. I just was tears were running down the side of my face. And, um, all of a sudden I, I couldn't, my breathing, breathing started changing and, um, I could feel like a sharp pain in my chest. And all of a sudden I couldn't breathe anymore. I couldn't get air in. I remember pulling my hand away from him forcefully and grabbing my throat. And I was starting like, like I kept, I couldn't speak. So I couldn't say anything. I just, he just saw that I was in pain and, I started convulsing. I couldn't get air and I started shaking. 
convulsing a lot actually. Um, and the, the whole process, I couldn't get any air. And I remember them, him running away and I just, I lost it and my body started convulsing. I felt like everything was being ripped apart in my body. I could feel my organs um, shutting down. It was very painful. I could feel like my, like, you know, when you get a cramp sensation in your body, but imagine this cramp is like a knife and it gets sharper and pain, more painful and more painful, more painful. And it, the pain just doesn't stop, you know? And I could feel like my liver, I could feel my stomach shutting down. I can feel like everything shutting down. And um, my muscles finally just was like seizing up and I could feel my eyes bulging out. And I remember them coming and put drilling, like, I don't know, they poked, they looked like they poked a hole in my throat to get some air and they couldn't get any air. Then they put this blue thing on my face and was pumping it and no air. And then remember they were like pumping my chest and stuff. And I was just like flying all over the place underneath their hands. And I kept hearing the woman's voice talk to me saying, um, don't fight, let go. You don't need to hold on anymore, let go. And um, it, it just, to me, I'm such a fighter in life. You know, I've been through so much in my life and uh, I'm not the quickest to let go, you know? <laughs> so I just kept fighting and then the pain just became so unbearable. I never felt anything like it. I felt like someone was just taking a knife and cutting through my whole entire body slowly. But like with every cut, something else was shutting down and... Basically, um, finally, I decided to let go. I couldn't take it anymore. And I finally let go. And basically, I, I felt my whole entire body turned to liquid or felt like liquid. And I was lit out, outside of my body. And the room was really bright and very spacey. And I could hear everyone's thoughts. I could hear what was going on in people's heads. And I could hear what was going on in other parts of the hospital. I can see in different angles. I could float above, be below. I could be from the corner. I can see every angle. And then I went on for a little bit. I was watching them, you know, doing everything they could to save me. And then I remember them, um, you know, shocking me. And I remember seeing that. And then it just, they couldn't do anything. I just remember them doing everything. And then all of a sudden my grandmother was standing there and my aunt, uh, my aunt Hazel, and she was an amazing woman when she was living and my grandmother. And she said, you know, you've, you, you have um, transitioned to this side and you're safe and you're okay. And don't be afraid. And we love you. And you have one more thing to go through when you're ready. And it's at your time when you're ready, or you can stay here and, you know, continue experiencing whatever, you, you know, basically what she was saying is that you can experience this hospital room and everyone's thoughts. And I, I kind of knew that I had to go on a journey and I wasn't really, I kind of turned away from that of me, of them trying to save my life to going into this kind of black look like I was inside of an ocean, but I was being swished around all around. And there was these beautiful colors I've never seen before these very echoing sounds and stuff. And then all of a sudden I saw myself standing in a hospital again. And this time I was looking at my mother giving birth to me. And I was also experiencing myself at the same time being inside of her womb. And that was the darkness that I saw with these lights and stuff through the stomach, through her, through the skin of her belly. And um, I remember touching and feeling and like experiencing all of these like echoes and sounds. And I guess it was the sounds of people talking from the outside. I was watching it all from both angles. And then I saw my birth and I saw that my dad wasn't there at my birth, uh, which is funny because I brought it up with him later on in life <laughs> and he was a little shocked by it. But then, um, you know, and then I went from that to like my, everything from like, you know, being a kid to my first day of school to like experiencing everything I went through as a kid and every person in life that I touched and all the things that it did to them because of me touching it and how it affected me and so forth and so on. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew until finally it ended up to me being back in the ambulance, having the seizure in the car and then back into the hospital and watching myself die again. And then it all kind of became like all together. I could see it all at one time. Like every single incident was happening. Every point of my life that was happening all at once. Like I was looking at a almost like I was looking at a, a movie, but in it at the same time, all at the at like multiple times, seeing my birth, seeing my first year of school, seeing the first fight I ever had, seeing everything. And then seeing the lives of the people all at once. And then there was just immense love that came over me. And that love, all of a sudden the light came. It was really beautiful. And um, 
the light came and all of a sudden I saw myself moving from this dark space into the light. It was almost as if I was saying I accepted my life with love and I was willing to let it all go in order to go into the light. And I did. And I let it go. And I went into the light and it was so warm. And I remember saying, this is, this is, I'm home. I remember just saying in my thoughts, I'm home, I'm home. And it just felt so good to just be back home. And I remember uh, being on a beach and I didn't have a body, but I remember looking down the beach and I could see other people's, uh, other people there on the beach as well. And the woman, the same woman from the hospital came to me and she said, um, what kind of body would you like to have for now? And I said, I want to be the body that I was before. And all of a sudden my body appeared, but I couldn't feel any bones. Like when you touch your hands, you feel bones, you feel wet and cold sensations and you feel moisture and dryness on your skin. I felt none of that. And I remember touching the sand and it was just so most amazing touch ever. It was like the best love best blanket, best food you've ever eaten, the best conversation you've ever had with a friend where you feel so warm and like loved and nurtured inside. And that's how it felt with everything. And I remember looking up at the sky and hearing music. And um, I remember she was asking, she said to me, I know you have questions. And I said, I do have questions. And we weren't talking through our mouths. That was another thing. It was all through the mind, or at least what I thought the mind was, but just consciousness. And it was... um, you know, she said, you know, I know you have questions. And I said, I do. And my question was, why do people suffer? Why do they have disease? Why do we have war on earth? Why, are, why do people um, have racism? Where, what, what is all of these things? And why does it exist? And why is there so much pain and hurt and death and destruction on our planet? And the question she gave me for every answer, every question that I asked was uh, a malfunction in thinking. It was very clear. It wasn't anything else. It was just humans don't use their thinking properly and they don't understand God. And I thought that was interesting and um, I didn't question it. But she went on to tell me that God is not what humans think, that God is not some, you know, um, Godfather or kind of like, that's kind of how I interpret it, the way she was saying, I make my own jokes about it now. But basically what she said was that God it doesn't operate on, on a level of human thought between duality of like what's right and what's not right. God is just a creator and everything that you see, God created and everything that you want, God creates. And so everything you're experiencing right now with me, she said, is what you're wanting to experience. And that's why God created it for you. And so she's like, just think of it as, you know, every time human beings think on, in, you know, um, use malfunction in thinking and don't think correctly, their God is creating all of their thoughts and all of their words. And so if humans were able to think for themselves and for their species and for their planet and for the animals and for nature, all of God would change everything. And so they're stuck in this idea that they're powerless. And they're also stuck in this idea that they're creating their own, their own misery. And yet at the same time, they are the one creating it because God's creating it for them. And they think they're getting punished or they think that life is treating them unfairly, but that's not the case. And she was explaining it to me. And when she was explaining it to me, it wasn't like she was saying it in a way that I was debating it. Like I didn't have this kind of like mindset, like, Oh, I'm going to debate what she's saying. I didn't have this, this need to debate at all. It was very just like, yeah, I knew that, you know, it's like when, you know, when someone tells you something and you just know it, Mm -hmm. that's what it felt like. I just knew it. And I didn't feel sad. I felt joy Mm -hmm. the whole time I was there. I never felt one feeling of sadness, Mm -hmm. not feeling of loss, not feeling of sadness, not a feeling of, I miss people and I'm sad about it. It was just like a feeling of pure joy, a pure content, pure peace. And she asked me afterwards, do you want to see other people? Uh, would you like to go and see this place a little bit more? And um, I said, yes. And so she took me, she took me to a community kind of area. It was like beautiful mountains and there's like a beautiful lake. And, you know, there were some buildings, but there were no cars. And I asked her why the buildings were there. And she told me, because people want that. So that's what they, God created it for them. 
And so I was like, oh. And then I was like, how is it that everyone, does everyone want the same thing? And she says, no, everyone wants different things. But what God does is basically take everyone's idea of what brings them joy and creates the perfect experience for them to have that joy in. And I thought that was amazing. I remember seeing these glowing lights and she said, that's the consciousness connecting. Everyone is connected here. So all we have to do is just, you know, decide where we want or think or whatever, and we can do it. And there's no rules. Like you can, if you want to eat, you can eat food. If you want to, you can eat anything and you can eat as much as you want of it. And you don't even gain weight, which I thought was really amazing. And um, what's is interesting because I'm sharing this part with you because I didn't, I never really, a lot of people ask me this in the press about like what happened to me. And I know I haven't, usually you don't get into the details of what I experienced because it's, it's a lot, but I, what I can say is, uh, however, what I can say is this, is that, um, it was the most amazing playground that I've ever been in where there's just pure love and everyone knows each other. And even when you don't think you know someone, you do when you meet them um, because you're all connected. And it's just that you all are living in different experiences, but you're all connected. You're all one. And so I was talking to this little girl who like, you know, she, she lost her life as a child when she was on earth. And so she wanted to be a little girl there. And so we had a really beautiful conversation and I got to see my family, which was great. I got to see my great grandparents and my family members. And I got to see friends of mine who died when I was young. Uh, one of my buddies I got to see was Josh Yortz. And he was a great guy who I remember from school. And I remember he died in a horrible car crash. And I got to see him. And I got to see a bunch of other friends there as well. And we did fun things together. We, we got to fly uh, one one point we changed ourselves into a sound wave and we were flying through the air as music and making sound in the sky and it was so loud we made it so loud and you get your own you get your own universe there that's your own heaven it was beautiful i mean the water tastes amazing when you sw- when you went swimming in the water it was the best water it was the perfect temperature the animals are connected to you like you can run with the lions i mean it was really amazing and I can see why we erased our memories because I learned that, that I learned from the being the, the my guide who was there, the woman, she had told me that when we leave this place, we erase our memories um, on certain places we choose to go because we um, have to the, whatever dimension we go into or a planet we go to, if we choose to incarnate on a planet or become a being on that planet, if we had full knowledge of this place, we wouldn't stay there. And some dimensions we go into our density, like planet Earth, for instance. So she was telling me to go to Earth. We came here because our brothers and sisters are trapped in darkness. And when she explained this to me, she immediately said to me as she was explaining it to me, she said, you want to go back, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And she's okay. And when do you want to go back? And I said, I want to go back now. And she said, well, let me explain some things to you before you go back. And it was very clear because what she was explaining to me was that we came to earth because our brothers and sisters used their power of creation to, to create darkness. And that darkness has been living in different areas of the of inner, of outer galaxies and other dimensions and so forth. But earth is it's in its own universe. Has, this part of earth is in darkness and our brothers and sisters are trapped in the field of darkness and they don't even know how to get out because they've been in there for so long that the darkness has polluted them of their own being a child of God. It, they, they don't know that they are this being of light and consciousness. So they are just living out their lives that when they were living in flesh, when they made decisions that were not coming from love and they hurt themselves and hurt people, it's not that God punishes, it's that they won't let go of it. Like, and then she was explaining it to me that when I died and I saw all my life flash, you know, like I got to see every portion of my life and how I affected other people and how I affected myself, they get to see that as well. But the difference was is that I let it go with love and went into the light, whereas they can't let it go because they couldn't accept that they did that. And so they go into the darkness because that's where they feel that they can be themselves and be able to deal with this energy they're holding on to. And when they get into the darkness, the darkness is, you know, um, has many layers. And depending upon what they believe they deserve, they go to that place and they start to relive a lot of their experiences and they need a host. And our, the host that they need to get out is us. That's the reason why to erase our memory, because we have to understand the darkness from a place of love. And that once we do, we then are able to move beyond 
the, the fear of darkness or the fear of everything that we've created as human beings and step back into our truth, which is light consciousness, which is the ability to create with the creator as we speak and as we think. And so therefore we will be able to bring them home. And this is an evacuation mission. And when she explained that to me, it was like a clear feeling came through my being while I was in heaven, which was, I got to go back. And so she immediately took me to the beach and there were a bunch of other people there too. And I was talking to these other people and they said to me, they wanted to go back too. And, and then all of a sudden we just kind of went into the ocean and all of a sudden went from that to this bright light. And then the bright light turned into outer space. And then out of space, I saw all these planets and I was like flying through space. And I remember just coming to earth and just floating above the earth. And I remember being able to communicate consciously with every other being who was going back and being and saying to them that I love them and that we all love each other and um, and we'll see each other again. And then we all were laughing a little bit and then just came right back towards earth like we were flying like a star towards earth like literally i saw light coming off my being as i was flying towards the earth and then all of a sudden i woke up in the hospital to this sharp pain in my body of this needle jabbing me with adrenaline and someone shocking me with electricity i felt electrical shock go through my whole body my heart jumped i felt my um body my heart jumped and i could feel the pain in my body and i remember just like coming up out of it, but I couldn't breathe. And I, the doctor had said something about me being paralyzed and brain damaged and that they were going to induce me in a coma, but they were inundating me with this tube down my throat. It was so painful. And, um, I just remember the freezing cold room and this touch, the, my skin having different temperatures and I felt bones in my body again. And like, I am in fear and all kinds of energies came up. And, um, the interesting thing was that when, before I left, heaven to come back the, my guide the woman who was there i'm still seeing her face right now as i'm talking uh she said to me that i was going to go through a lot of pain and suffering for a long period of time of earth time and that i would be okay because it's a part of my path that i need to understand human suffering because i've come to help wake up the people because i've asked for my memories to be fully intact of, of what it was like on the other side and she told me that i would have you know, um, new powers and abilities that I would be able to do to show people how to access things that they never thought were possible. But in order to do so, I have to use it on myself first to prove myself that I can do it and that she'll be with me the whole process. And I remember darkness was there too, talking to me when I was in the hospital. And she had told me this before I went back to earth. When I went back into my body, she came into the room and told me to remember and then they put me and they induced me into a coma because they couldn't, they couldn't resuscitate me long enough without dying. I think I died like six times according to my medical files. And they decided to put me in a coma until they could figure out how to stabilize my body. And in that coma, I was like walking around the hospital and I was like watching people come and visit me. And it was very interesting. And then... <laughs> 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 you know, I was like going to my house and visiting my house where I lived and like seeing that there are people in my house and, you know, I could walk close to them and I could hear their thoughts. And I, I mean, it was very, very interesting what I experienced in the coma. And um, moral of the story, if anybody in your life's in a coma, be aware of what you're saying. Around truly, them. <laughs> truly. They hear everything. everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the, so that was interesting. And then what was interesting, too, was uh. When she told me that my body was able to to hold my energy, uh, that I could go back, but I had brain damage and so forth, I had to heal my brain. So I, you know, it took me maybe I would say about a month to heal my brain. So I put my brain back together and then couldn't heal the, what my brain damage did to my body yet. And that took about another four months. And then I couldn't heal my kidneys, my liver was fine, everything else was fine. My lungs came back. Um, and that came back by force because the doctors basically told me that if I couldn't breathe on my own, they had to pull me off life support and that's the best they can do. Um, so I told, you know, my guide, can you please show me how to breathe again? And it was a really intense experience, which I'll never forget. I mean, if I go back to it in my head right now, I remember I felt like I was in some kind of like boot camp of some kind <laughs> where she literally was like, you're going to have to breathe beyond the pain. Of, mm -hmm. You have to force yourself to breathe and say in your head, I can breathe. And you got to do it all night long until you believe it. And so I did. And that morning I was breathing. 
and then they took me off the the life support and the respirator um and all the things they had in my mouth and that was nice to get out of get that nasty tube out of my mouth because that was really painful being sitting down in my my mouth like that and another tube up my nose that was really uncomfortable uh and then and then um you know, I was paralyzed and they told me that I should go to some kind of like place where people can take care of me around the clock. But my sister and my friend Melanie were there and my friend Melanie, the whole time my dad, what they kept telling my dad, I was gonna, that they think I should make, make funeral arrangements. And, um, when I was in my coma, they kept saying, tell my dad, like, there's no hope. There's no way he can recover. He died. I died with a 10.6 potassium. I don't know if anyone knows about potassium and medical knowledge. Um, most people, if you have a seven potassium or maybe even a six and a half, you would fall down and die immediately and you would never be able to be resuscitated. Uh, people in prison usually die when they give you death penalty. They give you about an 8.1 potassium. I was at a 10.6 six to doctors and i've talked to many of them that's just there's no they don't even consider resuscitating you because there's no way they can get your organs to come back on because your whole body what happens is when you die with the 10.6 all of your organs shut down one by one until you go into cardiac arrest which is what happened to me um and then your heart shuts down uh because of the potassium because everything's a muscle and potassium supports the muscles in your body so it starts shutting everything down they can never resuscitate people from that and the fact that the doctor dr agatep who's an amazing doctor and he said to me at the hollywood presbyterian he said to me that he they already told my parents that there was nothing they can do like they already told marcus they like already said like you know we did everything we could but they didn't take me off of the the those little things like against the eg eg key uh the eg meter or mm -hmm. egk meter or whatever and they heard a bleep and the nurse ran and got the doctor and then they just started like doing everything they can to like resuscitate me and they finally found a way to get me back but they couldn't stabilize me so they put me in a coma and to see if my body would start to heal itself and then it did and then i came out of the coma being in a wheelchair, not being able to walk, not being able to use my legs, not being able to fully function in my hands. I couldn't bend my feet, couldn't bend my fingers. So I had a lot of friends join up on a sign up list to take care of Shaman Durek, take care team. And they took turns after work coming over and feeding me and bathing me and taking me to the bathroom, you know, all kinds of stuff, playing, like laughing with me, talking with me. And then I just, but I had my thoughts and this, the guy, the woman guide was talking to me and then darkness was also talking to me. Darkness was like, there's no way you're going to heal yourself out of this one. And darkness would say to me, why did you come back? The people are, they don't need you. They're happy with their creation. They're happy knowing, they're happy believing that there's a God that punishes them. They're happy having these types of rules that they've created for themselves. They don't need you to come in and mess things up. And I remember just saying in my head, like, I didn't travel that far from, from heaven to take another body, to have you come and talk to me and tell me that I can't succeed at what I've put my mind to succeed. So I ended up healing my legs about a year and a half. Um, it took me and my toes bended like maybe two, three years after that. My hands came back, which took, which also took about a year and a half. I was on dialysis for 10 years after that. And uh, my sister gave me a kidney I was doing everything I could to heal my kidney, but there was something I just wasn't figuring out. And then the spirits told me that I was blocking it because I had fears about people, you know, getting in my face about, okay, you can heal kidneys, heal my cancer, heal this. I wasn't ready to take on that role. And also it was like, for me, it was kind of like a, I want you here kind of thing. So like I used to always say to people, I never complained when I was on dialysis. I used to go to dialysis center Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I used to go early early did my appointment so I can give the nurses massages <laughs> and like, and hang out with the doctors and, and learn more. And mm -hmm. then I would go to other patients and find out why they weren't taking their medication. Why weren't they taking their, you know, their phosphorus, phosphorenols and things like that to stop them from like their bones breaking because of the calcium leaching. And, you know, I was getting really into that. And because I already had a degree in health education and I was a shaman. I was also using my shamanic abilities to help other patients to become stronger and giving them mindsets, teaching them meditation, teaching them how to use their abilities. And the doctors used to laugh all the time and be like, you're such an interesting person. Like people dread coming here. You come here early so you can bring love to everyone. So it was nice. I created like bingo night <laughs> and movie night. And I did sessions, four hours uh, session in the chair. It was the most painful experience. And um 
you know, going every two months, having my arm opened up again and having surgery every two months and for 10 years and having my blood drained out of my body three times a, uh, a week with my heart pumping faster than a person who would run the marathon it was very painful at night. But every night I went to bed, I just, you know, this, my guide was there and she told me how to handle the pain and that, you know, I was learning, I was using it as a learning school. A tool to realize that just because you're in pain, you don't have to go around being nasty to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I still, I was working with clients while I was like on my off days, which would be Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would take clients, three clients a day, helping them work through their issues while being on dialysis. And I also did charity work for children's battering places. Like I didn't give up. And I think you know, the whole experience strengthened me to understand human suffering, but it also strengthened me on the resilience of a human being. It gave me more knowledge as a shaman and how I can help people. And it's really given me an ability to recognize no matter how things may look or how bleak they may seem, there's always a chance for recovery. Definitely. No, I, so I had heard this story before and I wanted him to talk about it. And I'm happy that you went into the fact that earth is like of darkness because I've written about this on the blog before where I said to like ex-boyfriends and stuff that like, don't date me. Like I, I'm like, there's darkness that follows me. Like there's just a dark cloud. And I would always tell people, and there was no other word I would ever use to explain the heaviness that was with me. And so when I first heard you tell this story, it was very similar to like how you described your guide explaining everything to you, or it was just like something that Normally I ask 5 million questions and instead I was just like, oh yeah, I knew that. Like that was something I already knew and I just needed somebody to put it into like words in this world to let me know like this isn't crazy. This is just eye opening, my eyes opening back up, you know? And I was just like, this is so cool. I remember like leaving after hearing you tell all that and like calling all my friends and being like, this is how the earth works. This is what's happening in the world. And they were all like, okay, okay. And I'm like, I need him to tell everyone this story because... It was one of those things where I was just like, it doesn't always have to be dark. It doesn't always have to be heavy. There is a way to change. And I want to pause here. So we'll kick off next week's episode with talking about the shamanic perspective on today's most common mental health issues. So let everyone know where they can find you in the meantime. You can check me out on Shaman Dirk on Instagram. You can also um, check out my podcast. It's called Ancient Wisdom Today to get leveled up in shamanic knowledge made modern and really understand how to step into your geniusness. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. And um, again, everyone stay tuned to next week's episode where we continue the conversation with Shaman Durek. We're going to talk about the shamanic perspective on today's mental health issues. We're going to give you guys some actual tools and exercises that you can start doing in your day-to-day -day life to raise your intuition level. And we're going to talk about how to enhance your psychic gifts as well as so much more. And Shaman also reads my veins for you guys so you can get a little sneak peek um, at just one of the ways that he works with people one-on-one. -on -one. But honestly, there's countless ways. I always tell people I'm um, going to a session with Shaman Dirk with zero expectations because you really just never know where it's going to go. Um, the first time I met him, like Eric and I talked about in the start of this episode, he read our energy alchemy. Um, and now he has this fun tool where he's reading people's veins. And then of course, there's the actual shamanic healing like we talked about at the start of this. So it's always something different. His guides really call him to do what it is you need most in that moment. Um, so until next week, I will talk to you guys soon. Make sure to check me out. Let me know what you thought of this episode. If this is your first time hearing about Shaman Dirk on my Instagram at the Confused Millennial. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, head on over to the link in the show notes to go ahead and subscribe, rate and review this podcast. It's greatly appreciated. All right. Talk to you next week.